soul, and mind. Man has enormous power, which is sometimes called psychic energy. Everyone has magical abilities, but they are deeply blocked. It turns out that you don't have to go far to reveal your internal reserves and potential. The amazing is very close, but man does not pay attention to it. Wind of Intention The soul comes into this world, trustingly extending its childish hands. A person is born as an individual, that is, a unique being. Then this individuality develops. Thoughts, knowledge, beliefs, habits, even character appeared later, like a plaque. And at the same time, all this did not form out of thin air. What was originally? If just a blank sheet of paper, then try to become a blank sheet for a minute. Close your eyes and stop your train of thought. If you contemplate the black emptiness, then for some time, you cannot think about anything. At some point, there is complete emptiness in your head. Did you stop being yourself at that time? The work of the mind is suspended, but some integral feeling remains that I am me. And how do you explain that you are you? A person's awareness of himself as an individual usually occurs in the context of his position in the social environment. But imagine for a moment that the social environment has disappeared and you find yourself suspended in space. You have nothing. No society, no earth, no sun, no past, no future. Only black emptiness around. Everything has disappeared. Only you remain. And what is left of you as a former personality? All knowledge and thoughts related to the environment. Habits, manners, desires, fears, hobbies. Character also acted only in relation to it. But this environment is no more. What is left of you? This question is very difficult to discuss within the framework of the concepts of reason. We will not consider in this book the eternal topic of the existence of the soul in man. It will take a lot of time and will not lead anywhere. For the purposes of transurfing, this question is not of fundamental importance. If you want, believe in the soul, or if you want in the subconscious. You can agree with the concept of the immortality of the soul, or you cannot. The only thing that is indisputable is that the human psyche includes both the conscious and the unconscious. From the very beginning, we agreed that we will attribute everything conscious to the mind and the unconscious to the soul. For simplicity and practical benefit, we need to clarify for ourselves only a small and narrow part of the question about the soul. It will be enough to draw only a rough line between the soul and the mind, feelings the first and thoughts the second. When you are visited by a state of delight, elation, inspiration, these are sensations of the soul. A painful, oppressive state is also its state. The mind is completely in the power of pendulums and its ideas and beliefs imposed by the same pendulums. The degree of human freedom is limited by the narrow framework of what is permitted. Man mistakenly defines his place in this world as either a servant or a master. From the point of view of transurfing, neither of these positions is correct. Man is nothing. He is just a drop that flew up from the ocean for a moment. Splashes of sea waves can serve as an illustration of birth and death. A drop separated from the ocean cannot feel unity with the ocean and receive energy from it. A separate drop seems to exist on its own and has nothing in common with the ocean. But when the drop falls into the ocean, it realizes its unity with the ocean. The drop and the ocean merge into one. They are one and the same in essence that is water. A separate particle of water can take various forms. A drop, a snowflake, an ice flow, a cloud of steam. The forms are different, but the essence is one. The particle does not remember and does not understand that it and the ocean 
are one and the same. It seems to the particle that the ocean is waves, foam, splashes, icebergs, a current, a calm. In the same way, it seems to the particle that it itself is a drop, or a snowflake, or a cloud of steam. It is difficult for the particle to see behind all these external manifestations one common essence water. Something familiar, but unclear elusive. Biblical texts on this issue reveal to us the truth, distorted by the concepts of the mind. The statement that God created man in his own image and likeness is true. It is only usually understood in a distorted form. God can take any form, but his essence is not that he has a head, two arms, and two legs. If we compare God to the ocean and man to a drop, then they have one common essence water. According to people who have been on the border of life and death, the soul experiences inexplicable peace and bliss from the feeling of its unity with the cosmos. The drop returned to the ocean, and the consciousness of its true essence returned to it. It consists of the same substance as the ocean. All the energy of the ocean passes through the drop. Throughout the history of their civilization, people have sought to evoke this feeling of unity with the cosmos during their lifetime. All schools of spiritual development ultimately pursue the same goal. To achieve enlightenment, or in other words, to feel one's unity with this world, to dissolve in the ocean of energy, and at the same time, not to lose oneself as an individual entity. What does a person who has achieved enlightenment receive? He receives at his disposal all the energy of the ocean of the universe. He does not see a fundamental difference between himself and this infinity. His mental energy resonates with the energy of the ocean. That is when the intention of the enlightened one becomes identical to the external intention, this powerful and incomprehensible force that controls the world. When the shape of the kite meets the necessary parameters, it rises up on the air currents. In the same way, a person is caught by the wind of external intention and carried away to a sector of space that corresponds to the parameters of his mental radiation. For purposeful movement in the space of variations, he needs to feel this wind of external intention as clearly as he feels the movement of air or water. Until a person realizes the essence and nature of his identity with the ocean, external intention is not subject to him. We will not set ourselves the goal of achieving enlightenment. This is too difficult a task. But to realize your goals, this is not necessary. There is no need to retreat to Tibet and meditate there. Transurfing provides one loophole that allows you to subjugate external intention to a small, but sufficient degree to fulfill your desire. The principle of this loophole is quite simple. The mind has a will, but is not able to control external intention. The soul is capable of feeling its identity with the external intention, but has no will. It FLIs in the space of variations like an uncontrollable kite. In order to subordinate the external intention to the will, it is enough to achieve the unity of the soul and the mind. This is a rather difficult but still realistic task. As has been shown earlier, the work of the external intention is quite noticeably manifested in the realization of our worst expectations. In this case, the external intention acts against the will of the mind. It remains to figure out how to realize the best expectations. In the chapter, Intention, we have already defined the first necessary conditions for mastering the external intention, awareness, reducing importance, and giving up the desire to achieve the goal. Soon, you will learn new secrets of transurfing, opening the door to this mysterious world of external intention. Sale of the Soul People perceive themselves in the external manifestations of the world only as material objects. All material objects have one common energy informational essence, which is not subject to ordinary perception. This is what 
is in the space of variations and determines the behavior of material implementation. The language of abstract designations that we are accustomed to using describes only the external manifestations of the energy informational essence. This original essence itself cannot be unambiguously described in the language of designations of the mind, hence such a multitude of philosophical and religious movements. Our perception has been formed the way it is, because from childhood we were taught to concentrate attention on individual elements. Look, what a child! These are your arms, and these are your legs. And this is your porridge. There's a bird flying. Perception adjustment occurs throughout life. The mind constantly brings any external data into line with the established template for describing the world. For example, if we have never seen a person's energy shell, then the mind will not allow it to open to our eyes so easily this does not agree with the usual template. In childhood, no one paid us any attention to the aura, so it was not included in the template for describing the world. Now, we can theoretically know that the aura exists, but we will see practically nothing. The mechanism of perception of the surrounding world is still a blank spot. We can only discuss its individual aspects. Ants, for example, have never seen stars. They have not seen the sun or the mountains or even the forest. Their vision is simply designed in such a way that from birth they have only dealt with nearby objects. Their perception of the surrounding world is fundamentally different from ours. And what does the world really look like? This is an attempt to ask a supposedly objective question and get an objective answer. However, this question itself is not objective. The world looks exactly as we see it, because the concept of looks is also an element of the template of our perception. In the template of a blind mole, for example, the concept of looks does not exist. The world shows itself to us in accordance with our template of perception and at the same time it looks nothing. There is no point in claiming that the world looks as usual, or as a cluster of luminous energy, or in any other way. It only makes sense to talk about its individual manifestations that we manage to perceive. Human consciousness is a social product. It is based on the concepts and definitions of everything that surrounds us. A person has a soul subconscious from birth, Consciousness comes when everything around is defined by concepts and definitions in human language. But the world does not exist because people have described it with their concepts. The human soul always remains illiterate in this regard. It does not understand human language. It understands only what we are accustomed to consider sensations. First, a thought arises, and only then is it formed into words you can think without words. This is the language that the subconscious understands. It is not words that are primary, but thoughts. It is useless to speak the language of reason with the subconscious. Not everything can be expressed with the existing set of concepts. As you have noticed, I have not yet managed to clearly explain what external intention is. Fortunately, people still have one method of universal expression works of art. This is something that is understood without words. The language of the soul is understandable to everyone. It is the language of things made with love and desire. When a person goes to a cherished goal through the right door, or rather, does his true work, he creates masterpieces. This is how what is called art is born. You can graduate from a conservatory and compose colorless music that is not even remembered. You can paint empty pictures, doing it technically impeccably. However, no one would think of considering them masterpieces. If you can say about an object, there is something in this, then it can be considered a work of art. What exactly is there, connoisseurs and critics will explain later. But this something is immediately clear to everyone and without words. Take, for example, the painting, The Smile of the Mona Lisa. 
This is a language that everyone understands. Words are not needed here. Words are powerless to express what is understandable to everyone anyway. And what exactly is understandable? It does not even matter. Everyone understands and feels in their own way. Of course, you can say that her smile is mysterious, or that there is something elusive in it, and so on. All the same, words cannot explain that very thing that makes the painting a masterpiece. The Mona Lisa has aroused such a lively interest, not only because of its mystery. Has it ever occurred to you that the Mona Lisa's smile and the Buddha's smile are very similar? It is believed that Buddha achieved enlightenment during his lifetime. In other words, he managed, like a drop, to feel his unity with the ocean. The Buddha's smile in all images is completely dispassionate and at the same time expresses calm and bliss. It can be described as contemplation of eternity. When you see the Buddha's smile for the first time, a strange mixture of bewilderment and curiosity appears. This is because it reminds the drop of something distant and forgotten the feeling of unity with the ocean. Any reminder of past unity touches the sensitive strings of the soul. After the emergence of human language itself, the language of the soul gradually atrophied. People were too carried away by the language of the mind, so over time it came to the fore. Even the way it happened is distorted in the framework of the concepts of reason, in the form of the legend of the Tower of Babel, according to which the gods were angry with people, because they decided to build a structure to the heavens. So they mixed up their languages and everyone stopped understanding each other. In fact, most myths and legends are true, but true in the interpretation of the concepts of reason. Perhaps the high tower serves as a metaphor expressing the power that people received when they gained the ability to consciously formulate their will in the language of reason. As already said, the soul can feel the wind of external intention, but it is not able to set the sail to use this wind. The sail is set by the will of the mind. Will is an attribute of awareness. The flight of the unconscious soul along the wind of external intention occurs spontaneously, uncontrollably. It is the awareness of the mind that makes it possible to purposefully express the will. At the initial stage, when the languages of the soul and mind were not so disconnected, the unity of the soul and mind was achieved easily. Subsequently, the mind became fascinated with constructing a worldview within the framework of its designations, which led it further and further away from understanding the original essence underlying the external intention. As a result of colossal intellectual efforts, the mind achieved impressive success in the technotronic world of material realization, but lost everything that relates to the unrealized space of variations. The mind went too far away from understanding everything related to external intention. That is why many of the provisions of transurfing seem so incredible. But still, the mind is able to regain what it has lost. To do this, it is necessary to establish relations between the soul and the mind. The difficulty lies in the fact that the soul, unlike the mind, does not think it knows. While the mind ponders the information received and passes it through the analytical filter of the template of its worldview, the soul receives knowledge from the field of information directly, without analysis. In the same way, it can directly address the external intention. In order to make this appeal purposeful, it is necessary to harmonize the will of the mind and the aspirations of the soul to bring them to unity. If such unity is achieved, the sail of your soul will be filled with the wind of external intention and will direct you straight to the goal.